Welcome to Four Finger Discount, where today we are very lucky to be joined by one of the true legends of the Simpsons empire. He started working for the show back in season nine. He either wrote or co-wrote classic episodes such as Natural Born Kisses, Jaws Wired Shut, one of my personal favorites, Trilogy of Error. He even wrote a segment in the upcoming Trios of Horror 33. He is the current co-show runner alongside the legendary Al Jean. He is, of course, Matt Salmon. Matt, thanks for your time. How are you, sir? Oh, my God. I'm great. I'm so thrilled to be back on the pod. And uh, it's Wednesday night in America, Thursday afternoon in Australia. This is the best. Now, I heard you say you got a table read tomorrow. Do you still get excited for table reads? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> were, you, were you ever excited for table reads? <laughs> well, I think I used to be either scared or excited. And now I just feel like it's, everything's going to be fine, no matter what. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> it does, well, it does matter. It's just whatever happens, I'll be able to handle it. Well, you're a you're a well oiled machine at this uh, at this yes. stage of the proceedings, and uh, and you're the captain of the machine. I'm I'm, I'm the captain. I'm like the the doddering old captain, r- rickety old boat. Are you just content now, where you just sort of have the mentality of, well, this show's just gone forever, right? We're never getting off the air. It's a weird. The feelings are weird, guys. It's not like we're never going off the air. To me, it's just like, can we make special episodes? Yep. It's just like, can we make them still special? Having spent so much of our lives doing it, like, can we dig deep into our creative hearts and work that hard and push ourselves that extra distance to find the depth or the humor or the idea or the character thing or the joke or whatever that makes it worthy of existing? So it's kind of like it's a Sisyphusian challenge of rolling the <laughs> rolling the rock up the hill, right? But Sisyphus in the famous oh god, it sounds so pretentious. Well, people, I'm going to assume people in Australia are literate. Um, <laughs> in the essay, the myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus, there's sort of an existential theory that even though Sisyphus is totally screwed, he knows he'll never stop stop rolling the rock. He can kind of defeat the curse by contorting his worldview so that he is hopeful every time so if, if he give even he will never if he st- continues to be hopeful every time he has defeated the per the curse despite the fact that on some level he knows he's going back to the bottom of the hill were you ever working on an episode that you didn't think was going to be special and then during the process you went wait a minute this is going to be one of those standout ones each season um probably <laughs> probably <laughs> you know the thing you guys know you're creative guys you know it's like you always think you've missed something or there's something else you could have done or the idea you had the, you took the idea to a level to a six, but really it could, there was a level that would have taken it to an eight. There's always that concern floating around. I mean, you know, there's an episode I'm really fond of and obviously super fans. I know we, we all love the classic years. I love them. You're going to see in the Halloween this year, little love letter to classic Simpsons, but you know, my bread and butter has been so-called the H, so-called HD era, mm-hmm. and I know, I know the deal. But uh, so there's one that I love in that era called um, Homer is where the art isn't. Do you know that one? I don't actually know that one. What's it? What season was that one in? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> in, in the in the late twenties. Late twenties. Okay. Give us the TV guide synopsis, though, please. Well, the thing is, when we originally wrote it, it was half a parody of a seventies kind of crime mystery show that never existed. (laughs) And then in the middle of it, we changed it to a hundred percent parody of a 1970s crime mystery show that never existed. So that was like where we, it was half crazy. And then we went full crazy. And you guys got to watch this one. It's a gem. That's what I'm finding because, you know, you've got those people online that will always be haters of the show post season 10, whatever, whatever about those guys. That's true. But we've got in the middle of season 16. And to be completely honest, I could probably count on one hand how many episodes I didn't really like. I think people just forget how great The Simpsons has been consistently for so long. Well, definitely it's been so long. That's for sure. (laughs) Jump ahead. You guys should give yourself permission to violate your premise and jump ahead and then jump back. Well, we do sometimes occasionally. But um, but yeah, I would definitely be doing that one for the episode you just mentioned. But I just want to touch on, like, this is always a busy time for you, for you guys. you got the new season's just launched a That's few weeks right. ago. This week, very exciting, you got the Not It special. Next week, right. Trios of Horror 33. Mm-hmm. Can I just start, mm-hmm. though, by asking, you must be thrilled to know that you're never again 
going to have to answer a stupid question about a Simpsons theory or how did the Simpsons manage to predict the future because you answered it in Lisa the Boy Scout, which I thought was a great episode. Oh, thank you, guys. I mean, I'm assuming you both liked it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that one was certainly like a, a love letter and a hate letter to ourselves. <laughs> when you say a hate letter to yourselves, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, there's like we kind of like make fun of some of our goofier moments and we sort of make fun of some of the more wacky stuff we've done. And, you know, we kind of make we kind of make fun of the memification of the show and the fam mm-hmm. that my daughter is saying good night. Yeah. Uh, good night. And the fan, sort of the fan, the fan theories. And, you know, it's sort of it's the kind of episode you can really only do in your fourth decade. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, though. But how much fun was it trolling people on Twitter with that image of Martin Prince about being a cop? Because so many people looked at that image and went <laughs> mental. <laughs> well, I wasn't trying to troll them. I, I'm not a troll. I'm not like a provocateur, gents, because then <laughs> I don't, it's, it's not fun. That part of it isn't fun. It was an accidental provocation, provocation in that, you know, if I have time, I'll sort of live tweet the episodes with little fun facts and stuff and mm-hmm. factoids and stories and inside tidbits that six or seven people care about, right? But for this one, and I in the just literally in the moment I had the idea, oh, I'll act as if I was going to live tweet the regular episode, Lisa the Boy Scout, with some sort of very generic sitcom-y, you know, gender equality plot. And then I'm going to react as if the show really has been taken over by, you know, hacktivists or, mm. you know, uh, you know, denial of service attackers and I'm freaking out in real life. But that they're showing these show ruining clips, so that, and then I accidentally phrased it in a in a way, the thing I accidentally phrased the tweet by pure chance that like, I was just a regular person, reacting to The Simpsons having done an insane story, that I didn't like, a la the Tamsarian story, you know, that kind yeah. of met, messed with the canon, right? Yeah. I was basic. The tweet read out of context, like the The Simpsons has done an even. Tam Zamir, Tam Zarian or Tam Zarian, and I am as a random person on Twitter am freaking out about. <laughs> as, instead of I'm the guy, I'm pretending to not know that these clips are being released that ruin the show, but so that people just read that, and of course in social media people don't take a minute for context or to process anything. They just want to react in the moment, you know, as emotionally and impulsively as possible, and then. And just and then never think about it again. Well, that was me, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't. I was no, not no. Uh, but I, I was not trolling you. <laughs> well, I mentioned it on an episode that we were recording a little while ago, and uh, Dando pulled me up very quickly and said, "No, not the case." <laughs> well, it's funny because Matt Summer put out a tweet today, and I went, "I don't know. I know the tweet you're talking about. Let's <laughs> all <always> calm down. <laughs> it's okay." <laughs> Matt, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned social media because, I mean, you've got a you know, long history with the show and over the course of time, you know, anyone with a Twitter account or a Facebook account or whatever now has real-time access to the ear or the attention of the creators of, their, of some of the work that they love. I'm wondering not how it's maybe affected your creative process or anything like that, but, I mean... Has, have you noticed any sort of uh, change or difference in the relationship that the fans have to the show in that time? You know, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think I, my, most of my Twitter dynamic is sort of output only, although mm-hmm. I guess I have been like maybe engaged. I, I really try to engage with people in a positive way. And if someone says something negative, I don't get sucked in or I just yeah. say like, you know, I love all our fans, the, the, hate, the, the lovers and the haters and anyone who's passionate which is sort of how I feel like I can't control people who just say knee jerk things like the show should have ended 20 years ago. The show should have ended 10 years ago, put it out of its misery. Like, you know, if, if it makes you feel good to say that <laughs> I, I, I pity, I pity you or <laughs> I guess I'm happy for you or, you know, whatever you're going through, I hope it's all right. And cause like, cause I certainly don't read Twitter and chime in that things should be put out of their misery. <laughs> <laughs> like that's not fun to me even if i secretly think maybe a show is past its prime i just i just quietly stop watching it because everyone's right as a citizen of the temporarily free world but the majority the majority <laughs> of those people don't even watch the show anymore anyway it's true it 
It's a, it's a lazy opinion. Yeah. Again, I, I cherish your right to express it. I cherish it. Tell me, um, tell me more about this rabbit hole episode, or was that the rabbit hole episode that you've mentioned recently? The YouTube rabbit hole episode. Uh, okay, right. Okay, so <laughs> they're both sort of rabbit holes in their way. The premiere, the habeas tortoise, yep. was the rabbit hole episode about Homer sort of getting, mm. you know, you know, a sort of social media, Facebook, yeah, consp- conspiracy, but also kind of mystery salt, you know, sort of. A cause, cyber sort of, sleuths, yeah. Sort of like cybers beginning with kind of a cyber sleuthing cause and then maybe going from zero to conspiracy surprisingly fast. So that's in that one, Homer solves the mystery by going down a, a literal rabbit hole that a rabbit dug and inside the hole is the, is the solution to the mystery that no one in his conspiracy group wants to believe is actually the <laughs> real solution. Can I just say I was very glad you guys finally gave Gil a, a W in that episode? Yeah, yeah, no, Gil did all right. Well, Gil <laughs> in tomorrow's table room, Gil also has a, another W. So is that is that, is that canon now? Are they, are they married going forward now? I don't, I, well, I don't know. I feel like as long as the group is together, the relationship is together. So if the mm-hmm. group survives, they're together. I mean, I guess they. I think they. I don't know if they got divorced. I'm just going to say this. You're not going to see them together a lot. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I know about the glue that holds a uh, relationship together. My partner and I are just hoping that they never cancel 90 Day Fiance because it's the one thing that sort of binds us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it is funny that like the people, they're the things that keep a, a relationship together. Like, well, we disagree about everything, but we love going to open houses and seeing how overpriced they are. <laughs> <laughs> That, that place is so overpriced. Oh, they'll never get that. But at that location, that square foot price, oh, they'll never get that. I love you, honey. Let's, <laughs> let's stay together forever. <laughs> Tell me, uh, so not it this week, the full length Halloween okay, episode. Okay, here we go. Yeah, not it this week. The, the time to do some promo. Let's promo this thing. Will this just be a, a Simpsonized version of it from start to finish or is it a different spin? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, no spin. No spin, guys. Just it. Zero spin. Just it with Simpsons. Is, okay, cool. Well, that's what we want. This is like... Fi- this is like mashup fan service, all frosting, guys. Cupcake with all frosting. Well, oh. Are we talking about the the movie or the book? Because the book's got some stuff in it. I don't want to see in The Simpsons. Uh, well, you know, uh, let's just say in the writer's room, there was some, you know, NSFW conversation about some of the book stuff. But uh, in, on the show, there's a hint of it. <laughs> but not, oh, a, not, you know, just like a, just, just, there's one joke that sort of. Yeah, right. About teen lust, let's just shall we say. Mm. So, is it based on the TV film, or is it the um, or is it the the newer ones? Well, we were certainly inspired by the success of the newer ones and how cool and they were. You know, we didn't really. I mean, this is really like on one level, it's very much just sort of our version of it. And as I've said, mm. like there were already so many people with tattoos of Pennywise Krusty, we might as well just make the episode. Yes. Just, <laughs> Just right towards the tattoos that already exist. We did um we did once have a, a design here. We're gonna make a bootleg shirt, which we don't do anymore, but we're gonna make a bootleg shirt, but it was Lenny dressed as clown gear, Lenny wise. Oh Lenny wise. That's you know, <laughs> I would I would say make it all. Yeah. Do it all. But like like we're not I wouldn't say I guess there's a little bit of a satirical spin on it, <laughs> which is that <laughs> headline is writer brags about by the numbers parody. Um, it's not, I don't feel that at all. I feel like we just wanted to tell the story of it and believe it, have our characters believe it emotionally. You know what I mean? Yeah. And sort of be, be present and tell a, a, a different kind of a love story with Homer and Marge and like an alternate future that you do care about. And one of the things that I think Stephen King, the writer is so good at, and I think is also the best parts of those movies is just the, the, teen dynamic between the fra- the kid friends mm. and like just the simple story of like so this the simple kind of love triangle that kind of is the the human story of it is that you know whatever 12 year old comic book guy has a crush on marge and then 12 year old homer comes into the group and you know she likes him more and he fe- even though he was never really with marge he feels cast out which is like mm. I just think a very simple, realistic kid thing that you have a crush on a girl and then a, a cooler kid comes along and she likes him and you just feel horrible. Yes. You know? Even though you were never together. Yeah. You were never together and you don't own her and she's not your property. But as a teenager, you're not mature and you're kind of like, no. 
Well, I saw her first, which is not legit, not a legitimate romantic tactic, <laughs> people, boys. And, but uh, to me, that's like the emotional core of this thing. And then there's all this clown stuff. And, you know, it's obviously crusty and he's kind of a hack. And there's a stuff about how he's sort of an intergenerationally unfunny clown from with, you know, cosmic magic. But like I, to me, it was important to make the kind of kid relatable love story the heart of it and how you feel like if you don't get the girl, your life can go off the rails and everything is ruined. And then, you know, maybe there's a way to make that right. Can we expect a lot of violence? Yeah, there's a fair amount of violence, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's any more super gratuitous than the most gory. Like Thanksgiving of horror or Halloween or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Thanksgiving of horror turned out so good. Yeah. That was very violent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to like. I'm going to stick with that. I don't want to draw too long a bow here, Matt, but I mean, I can see a through line between, you know, King's Main, his uh, Castle Rock, his Derry, all those spots, and Springfield itself. They both got the same sort of sense of spirit of place, big cast of characters, you know, that you can sort of draw from and intersect. So that's just me blowing a whole bunch of smoke, man. I hope you appreciate it. Um, (laughs) I do. but, But the other thing was I wanted to ask about, you talked about the emotional core of, of, of this uh, Not It episode. And it sort of leads into something I wanted to ask about the writing process or the creation process of an episode. Again, forgive me if I'm sounding awfully wanky here, but I mean, do you find you have to start with like the emotional core or foundation of a story or it's like, I've got a really funny idea for an episode and sort of build it from that? Or, you know, is it either or? Is it both? Um, Sorry, that's a really... No, it's a great question. I think it's both. Every episode is where we have a big, broad idea that just sounds funny, and then we have to find an emotional through line or it's just a bunch of wacky shit happening. And then there's episodes that start with an, an emotional, like a betrayal or a, a really bad feeling or something really tragic or something really real, and then we try to make that funny. So, like, there are definitely shows that have, I can't think of any great examples. I'll give you an example of one that started with an emotional thing is the one that I wrote a million years ago called The Ha Ha Couple, where, like, Melson has a birthday party and Bart convinces all the kids not to go. And then mm. Marge says he has to go and he's the only one there. And like Mel- Nelson is shattered. And like that, you the feeling of being at a party where you're the only person and mm. it's your fault that you ruined it. And Nelson feels so bad. Like that was like, okay, that was like the emotional beginning of that episode. And that's not like funny, but it is dramatic and it is relatable. And if you think sad things are funny, which we do, then it is funny. Yeah. And then there are certainly shows where we just like, this is so wacky. If we don't put in four scenes where Marge is upset about it, it's just mm-hmm. going to seem like nonsense. Marge is good for the Marge is useful for making like the audience, like the audience care about things. Yeah. Like if Marge, I just think if Marge cares, you care even more, maybe even more so than Lisa. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. We, we recently revisited, um, Colonel Homer, which I, I know is sort of is, is prior to your to your sure, era, Matt. Sure, but, sure. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan. But, you no, know, we but we were just so taken with, yeah, as I was saying, the the emotional sort of foundation of it. This uh, you know love story for the ages that seems on the verge of fracturing because you know uh, this other woman has got a crush on Homer, and you know Marge is afraid that Homer might be you know his his eye might be drawn away. But then again, it's just full of so much hilarious stuff as well. Yeah, I mean it's a uh, and when we've talked on the show about our, our favorite episodes and what makes The Simpsons so good, it's that combination of those two elements. You know, it's it'll hit you in the funny bone and then sort of pierce your heart as well. Well, I hope so. Like for tomorrow's table reading, there's definitely a chance Jim Brooks is going to, in not so many words, say, where is the emotion? This thing needs more emotion. This is just kind of a broader satirical episode. At which point you say to him, well, yeah, you write broadcast news. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you know about emotion? Um, no, I mean, you know, we'll find, we'll find a way. Life finds a way. Have you ever been, like, talked down by Jim Brooks at a table read saying, do better? Not at the actual read, but <laughs> in the meeting afterwards, sure. There's definitely been ones where he hasn't loved it, but I really cherish the dynamic with Jim. And, like, if he's not loving it, there's probably a good reason. Mm-hmm. And we'll work to find a solution. And he's really open to solutions. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's like he'll, he'll, he'll pitch ideas about how to fix something or what to add or what is missing. But also if we have an idea, the knowledge that he knows there's a, a hole, like we're all really motivated to, to fill it, you know? 
It's pretty reassuring knowing that after 34 years, he's still just as passionate about the show as when it first started. No, he's, yeah, no, the passion is not dim. Yeah, that's incredible. Mm. Not dimming. Do you still see The Simpsons as The Simpsons or is it The Simpsons and Friends without no longer having that fear of having to include the family in a major way in an episode? That's a good, good question. Um, I'm not super personally obsessed with making sure that every family member is super represented in every episode. Like I know that they will be covered over the course of the season and probably the best stories have all four of the family members have a distinct, interesting attitude. And it's it's about a a dynamic that they're all involved in. But, you know, obviously there's the one with like Chalmers and Skinner on the road trip and the road to Cincinnati. And that was obviously a deliberate break from the style of the show by like having them leave town and Bart is barely in it. But um, there are definitely shows where like one family member will be missing Usually not Homer, and uh, I th- think that's okay because we'll 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 make sure they're covered. Like recently, we we had one, we had a table read where I realized, oh shit, Yardley doesn't have any lines in this. <laughs> Yardley's <laughs> coming to the read, and I was like, um, Yardley, I, we kind of screwed up. We didn't write any lines for Lisa this week, and she's like, oh, I don't care. I'll just come and laugh and be a cheerleader because you know she. We've done so many. Oh. good Lisa stories with her that have been really rich lately and where she's really like a kid, like really more interested these days in Lisa as a kid than Lisa as like either a super politicized, you know, ideologue or as a kind of, you know, genius, super genius graduate mm-hmm. student. Which I think is a better, a better version of Lisa. Lisa should be a kid. I mean, she can still be smart yeah. and feel is- lonely and isolated by yeah. her intelligence for sure. And she can certainly be sad about stuff in the world, but let's just have her be immature and eight years old or at least act like she's 12. Yeah. Get crushes on Corey's. Yeah, exactly. Although they'd be Chris's nowadays, wouldn't they? Yeah, the Chris's. The Chris's. Yeah. One thing I noticed with the um, with the season 34 episode so far is that I feel like Homer's changed back to how he felt in those first earlier seasons. The term jerk ass Homer, you'd be well aware of it. It seems that's just gone now. Was, was, was there a creative approach to let's get rid of that element of his character and try and get back to what people loved about him? I wouldn't say it was conscious. And I do think it's important that Homer stay sort of selfish and quick to anger and kind of lazy and flawed. You know what I mean? Like, you think that's important. You don't want to lose that part of him. And obviously dumb and easily manipulated and all kinds of things. But I think at the end of the day, he really is so in love with Marge and that's like, a, you know, it's like a deep super love. And like you saw, maybe mm. saw that episode that Carolyn Omine produced and John Frank wrote about the, you know, the lost in the wilderness, pixelated and afraid. Mm. That's like really like a good, great love story with those two. And it's about the intimacy of, you know, watching 90 day fiance and that kind of stuff, you know, Cash <laughs> like how like, about yeah. like how that you can find love in those kinds of small, gross, ratty <laughs> robes and, take out mm. Chinese level kind of love as opposed to like grand gesture and cinematic sacrifice kind of love. Although there are lots of cinematic sacrifices in that episode. We also must sure that, make sure that we touch on uh, the, the episode next week, Treehouse of Horror 33. The first time right. we've ever had a solo writing credit, correct? On a Treehouse of Horror? Yes, that's true. I, I forced them to put my name on the third segment, <laughs> which because it was an idea I'd had for a long time. Yeah. This kind of Simpsons in a... Westworld type amusement park, uh, you know, of ultra realistic super robots for ultra fans. I always thought that was a good idea. And I could have, we could have done an hour long episode in that park. I mean, I would have loved to do a two parter as opposed to a six minute, but I do really want it to be a love letter to like the classic show where like you, you guys would go, they probably have this park in Australia. You guys would go there, they would spray your skin yellow, you, you'd walk around. <laughs> And, you know, you all the different classic episodes are kind of going on at once. Mm-hmm. And you're going to walk around from episode to episode and everything. There's 20 homers and 50 bards and 70 sideshow Mel's running around. And I mean, it's actually a much more workable version of a immersive, super futuristic theme park than Westworld, which you could easily get killed or see something so traumatic. You would never be yeah. a, a functioning adult again or do something so horrible. You could never go back to society in the Westworld as presented in the HBO show. I mean, just because the bullets don't technically kill you doesn't mean you couldn't die easily in that Westworld. 
always a bit of a yeah <laughs> a design flaw in the HBO Westworld is like I don't think the extreme tourism market is that big that no. you're going to um yeah this is this place is not going to turn a profit <laughs> no because you're either a a murderer or a sexual maniac or just really 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 big history buff the Venn diagram for that is I don't know <laughs> complicated <laughs> very but it's like but the Simpsons one where you can't die and a million funny things are happening and there's 20 homers everywhere and everywhere you look, a real Simpsons episode is playing out. I think that would be successful. I'd be very, very successful. <laughs> I mean, Dis- Dis- let's build it, Disney. Do it. <laughs> let's, let's get those androids going. Do you just have the head of Disney on, on your phone just ready to go? No, I give them a, a wide berth because I, they I trust them to just take care of business. It's all going to be good. <laughs> I remember when Disney first bought Fox and I panicked. I thought, oh, is this going to be it for The Simpsons? But I honestly think that Disney buying Fox and in turn The Simpsons, putting them on Disney Plus, has been a huge plus for The Simpsons as a whole because I think it's just made the ability to be able to access new episodes so easy for fans because for so long, in particular here in Australia, I just gave up because it was too hard to find the new episodes oh, on one channel, then they got moved to another, different time slot. Now we know every Wednesday, pick up the remote, new Simpsons, bam, I'm able to keep up with the show again. And as a result, I think it's created somewhat of a Simpsons revival with fans. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's so clean, the interface. You know, I mean, we, we always sort of wish, well, well, can't the commentaries be on there? Oh, man, that's one mm. thing I always complain about. <laughs> you know, also, could we do more? I mean, we're, we're now... 14 years behind comment in the commentaries or something like that for crying. Maybe not. I think he recorded a bunch. We never put anywhere. Who even knows where those are, but uh, the clean interface, you can't, you can't search by episode title, but I understand why you can't because then every time you search for anything on Disney plus only Simpsons episodes would come up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you would have to set a filter to say not Simpsons for most of your searches because you know, with the, so many episodes, and I understand why they don't want to make the interface more confusing with sub panels and you know sub menus mm. and this is the Simpsons exclusive area. I get it, but uh, yeah, and it's, it's just what's great is that yeah, globally, it's really we can inject the show right into people's heads so quickly. It's a big deal because you weren't even aware that we were getting it so soon, were you in Australia? No, right? Because in America, we may be a day behind, but our our Simpsons appearances on Disney Plus is literally a year behind. Oh, like okay. they dump, they they dump a whole. Like you can you stream The Simpsons on this thing called Hulu. Have you heard of Hulu? Yes, even Hulu. Yeah. So Hulu has The Simpsons one season at a time for a year. So now thirty four episodes are on Hulu, and then you know once all twenty two of those are there, that next September those will all get smooshed to Disney Plus USA in twenty twenty three, in like October twenty twenty three. Yeah, well, we, we just have it, we're, we're two weeks behind now, but for a, a couple of years there, we were only three days behind. So I just think it's just been a big help for me personally as a, a big Simpsons fan, just made it so easy. Mm-hmm. And, I, and it's, I love it because I'm able to just keep up with all the show now. It's awesome. It's really good. And I do think the show is so popular globally to be able to get the new ones on there so quickly is, 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 a, is a thrill. With the Simpsons shorts on Disney+, Plus, what about them? It seems they all have to have a, a Disney twist to them, right? That's fine. <laughs> Personally, for me, the whole Disney owned Simpsons gag has kind of run its course. Is there ever going to be a chance yeah, where it's just maybe. going to be a a Simpsons story as a short, or they, is there like a Disney quota that needs to be met with those things? You know, it's a great question. I think the genesis of those shorts really came from Jim Brooks, and he wanted to like cherish our special relationship with Disney Plus as maybe something, maybe we're one of the more adult things on Disney Plus, or at least when it first launched, we were. And so he wanted to we, he wanted to say, look, we're here. We're part of the Disney family, but we're still the Simpsons. We're still somewhat, somewhat subversive. We're still playful. We're still going to make fun of ourselves. You know, how, how can we do that using the Simpsons imagery and the Disney imagery together? So, you know, and Al is, I think Al has kind of been really the, the main, cre- Al and Jim have really been the main creative force behind these shorts. I think they're all really fun and entertaining. I mean, they might skew a little younger, you know, and just be like, oh, isn't it cute to see Maggie in Star Wars or, the Lisa Billie Eilish one, I think, I think that was Jim's idea. If it wasn't, I'm sorry, everyone, whoever's idea it was. <laughs> when Jim listens to this podcast, he's going to be so mad. At me. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think it's a way to like say we're not just another thing on Disney Plus, but we are like inter. We're like we the way we used to make fun of Fox 
we now have to we have the obligation to make fun of Disney. But okay. we all we all know that at the end of the day, we're making fun of either of our corporate owners all the way to the bank, right? <laughs> As that's always been the way. It's always seemed to work. So why would you change it? I mean, I don't think Ru- I mean Rupert ever minded us saying super harsh stuff about Fox or Fox News because he knew it was good for business. Yeah. Guy, tell him one of your favorite moments of all time. <laughs> My favorite line of all time is I'm Rupert Murdoch, the billionaire tyrant. The fact that you actually got him to say that uh, on the record is just brilliant. He had no issue with it. That's amazing. <laughs> I don't think he, th- I think he just thought it was accurate reporting. The one time he was behind accurate reporting. Good on you, Rupert. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Matt, I'd like to ask about um, your position as showrunner, your duties as showrunner. I mean, you, you've been in the gig for, what, 18 months, two years now? Is that about right? Or? <laughs> it's a wacky journey, guys. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's sort of been a gradual thing where, like, you know, all this stuff is on the blessed internet. You know, like, just sort of, they, you know, sort of let me do a couple, a few every year and then a few more and then a few more and I'll kind of get promoted to doing this high level stuff. And, you know, then we're sharing the duties and now I'm sort of doing, the, I guess, the majority of them, but I also am like trying, I have my, if anyone is interested in this, you know, I have a sort of a lieutenant now for every episode, like we call a co-runner that mm-hmm. is all very transparent on internet and stuff about, you know, sort of the senior writers each kind of shepherd the episodes and I kind of supervise that and, and as Al still does his shows and those are great. So it's just sort of a way to keep the manage the workload and also take advantage of like the passion to produce original stuff that we all have and that the writers that have been there for a long time to give them a little more creative autonomy the way I was given more creative autonomy because you get good work out of people if you just say just make this the craziest, funniest, saddest, most emotional thing you can. Does that make any sense? It does, because as, as you said, the show is in its 34th season now. I mean, you've got to strike, I guess, that um, that balance of having people who have been on the show know not just how The Simpsons run, but how a TV show runs. Right, While right. at the same time injecting new voices, new attitudes, new points mm-hmm. of view into the writer's mm-hmm. room and into the show itself. I think if you sort of skew it one way, you know, too far one way, the show either seems stale or it seems like it's trying too hard. But, I mean, it strikes me that you guys have kind of got that balance. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I did, it's what's, what's the, the, the only reason any of this is possible is because each show is its own little mini universe, you know, with its, each episode, each story from beginning to end is kind of like its own little movie or its own microcosm of itself. So that if, if, if these had to be connected, you know, and we really had to like maintain continuity. I do love continuity, but you know. Uh, but you're a comic book guy, Matt. I mean, th- th- those, I mean, <laughs> you're not comic book guy, but you are a comic book guy. And sure, you know, sure. those things splinter off and have, you know, weird timelines and you yes. know, ignore continuity all the time. Yeah, no, it's for sure. And uh, I just, I've said this a million times and no, no one ever, people are, certain fans just determined not to hear this. Whenever we do an episode that playfully contradicts another episode, we are—it is not a retcon. Like I don't believe in retcons. I just believe it's fl- it's silly, flexible, wacky con, and that in no way are we ever saying an old episode didn't happen, or that this is the real story, and that that didn't—that isn't the way it went down, or that isn't how Homer and Marge met, or this is the real story. We're just saying they've been on TV for forty years; they haven't gotten older. Something's got to give. <laughs> well, we have the approach now with the podcast. We're only in, in the middle of season 16, but we go, okay, each episode, let's just watch it in its own little capsule. Did it entertain me for 22 minutes? If it did, good. Two thumbs up. That's all that matters to us now. <laughs> well, I hope so, because I mean, obviously we're going to repeat ourselves in some ways. Yes. It's, it's really unavoidable. And if it brings people joy to notice that and be angry about it, then I'm, we've done our job. <laughs> Just a couple more questions and we'll wrap this up because I know sure. you're short for time and you got okay. a table read tomorrow. But um, Oh, my God. The, the first time the show you've said that really opened your eyes was The Call of the Simpsons with the, the rabbit trap scene uh-huh. where, back when you were 18 or so. Can you remember the first yes. time one of your gags got a big laugh at a table read or in the writer's room? Oh, man. What if it hasn't happened yet? <laughs> <laughs> we're just assuming there are too many to remember. Because the first one you solo wrote was what, Natural Born Kisses. There must have been a moment there where people were just bursting out and you went, yep, I've made it. I've made the Simpsons writer's room laugh. 
not quite sure about that. <laughs> he was more like, hey, let's rewrite this a lot. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that sounds like that'll be fun. You guys know, you guys, you guys know best. Um, that was more the attitude. Um, there was something in an episode where Homer gets tricked into one of those scofflaw things by being told he's won a boat. Oh, yes. Can you remember the feeling at the time? Was it a moment of, I've finally done this? Well, in the beginning of any job like this, the feeling is not like, I've finally done it. It's just a brief moment of relief before the worry mm. that you're not going to do it again. Yes. Is yeah. uh, probably the more accurate description of it. When was the first time a, an episode of The Simpsons moved you emotionally? Oh, golly. I don't know. I really, you know, I think you know, those classic ones were so... Definitely, like, <laughs> the way we was is very emotional. The yeah. Homer Marge love story, which in no way does the 90s show say didn't happen. God, I sound, I sound offensive, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I have no issue with the 90s show. I remember when it first aired, and I loved it when it first aired, and I watched it recently, and I still enjoyed it. So I, I, It holds a special place in my heart, but it's, it's not a retcon. <laughs> <laughs> is that going to be on your tombstone? Not yes. a retcon. Yes. <laughs> it's just a silly side universe of a Groundhog Day myth of Sisyphus, self-contradictory, <laughs> paradoxical, morphable, bizarro reality, right? What other explanation yeah. is there? There is none that I can think of. Well, guys, are there any other questions you have for Matt before we let him go? I think he summed it up very, very nicely. Although I was about to say, I think that uh, the epitaph on Matt's tombstone would be, the continuity ends here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yes. I'll say, I'll say ret retcon this. Um, <laughs> well, like, I'll just say, you know, the so the Not It show I don't know, airs on in America Sunday the 23rd. And it's written by the great Cesar Meza Riegos and co-run by the great Brian Kelly. And the the Halloween, the regular treehouse, they're both, I consider them both in the treehouse family. The regular treehouse with three stories written by Carolyn Omine, Ryan Coe, and me, uh, co-run by Carolyn Omine Ogali. And that's directed by Rob Oliver. The other one was directed by uh, Steve, the great Steve Moore. And the definitely the... I'm really, really proud of the the the, the, the trilogy Treehouse two guys. Like we watched it on the big screen at the premiere party, and usually people aren't really paying attention. And you know, you could feel the audience was captured engaged. by the narrative. Yeah, great. They were really engaged. Like the first one is really scary. It's just a very simple kind of demon possession story with Marge and Maggie, but scary. And the middle one is legit anime, animated by this fantastic animation company called DR Movie who just like executed the Simpsons universe in like pitch perfect death note anime style. And then the third one is this uh, kind of Springfield world parody that I would say it should be on Easter. It's got so many Easter eggs. Hey, that's the one with the Bob's Burgers crossover, I believe. Yes. That's the big, that's the spoiler alert. There is a Bob's Burgers thing that is the payoff. Uh, oh, okay. But I guess not going to be a big surprise. Not uh, oh, and but there, there's there's one other really there's another exceptionally cool element of that something we've only done one other time that I well except no I've probably done it in couch gags, but there the wraparound has there's something very unique about it Ooh. for that too. Yeah, because the wraparound used to be part of my favorite part of the um the Treehouse of Horrors, and you you got rid of those over time. But yeah, I'm looking forward to this. That's exciting. Well, it's very short. I mean, I. Those stories, it's so hard to tell a full story in one act yeah. that like the wraparound for me is the, the least important thing. Like to have a long wraparound, I don't want to eat away at the plot of the actual chunks. But uh, yeah, I don't even think we've written the wraparound yet for the season three hours of horror 34. Yikes. Wow, wait. Still Good going. Golly. Glad to see. Yeah. I'm Well, I, I showed you guys that little sneak preview of yeah. our love letter to the super Australian super fans, but... You know, it's all all in good fun. I hope the Australian people will appreciate being represented as super fans and not feel it's like a hate crime. Yes, because we we like to consider ourselves the biggest Simpsons fans in the world here in in, in Australia, and we are very well represented in Simpsons World and Trials of Our Thirty Three. So make sure you look out for that. Thank you, Matt. Once again, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, and all the best for the remainder of season thirty four and beyond. Thank you, Matt. Bless you guys. Awesome. <laughs>